Welcome in. How Another are new you? week with sun beating down. Yes. Looks like we have some thunderheads starting to accumulate. Not going there. to accumulate. I am not going to complain about the sunshine. I'm not going to talk Why about. Why would we? I'm going to not going to talk about how oppressively hot it is or how bad the heat index is, because I'm just so sick of rain every single day. My lawn finally got cut over the weekend after five weeks. Oh my God, you're lucky you didn't have the Karens with your uh, homeowners association coming after you oh, with I a dare. shotgun or something. Well, there were a whole lot of people that, that were in the same boat. Uh, we, we had a bunch of those bullseyes, in addition to all the stuff at the end of May. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, on Friday, uh, what Jay Grimes, the chief meteorologist from Channel 9, uh, said is he said, right here at the intersection of Highway 30 and the Iberville Parish line, mm -hmm. five and a half inches in 45 minutes. He said, that's what the radar, I mean, that's, so what we had was, it wasn't that it was too high to cut, the lawnmowers would sink into the muck because yep. when the grass is that high, it doesn't dry. Yep. And tires get stuck. The, the cut's too low. But yeah, I'm not going to complain about this sunshine. Let not it, at all. let it pour. Not at all. And boy, with three systems still active, Fred has come ashore, of course, yesterday. Fred Panama came ashore. City, right? So and Panama so City and is now up in, uh, I think it's Georgia, headed for the Carolinas right now. Fred stopped and, and got a... Uh, uh, a muscle shirt that said no fat chicks while uh, it was in Panama City? We're talking about Tropical Storm Fred. It never did make hurricane strength. Now Grace is expected to become a Cat 1 hurricane after crossing the Yucatan Peninsula, but its landfall is expected to be somewhere along the central Mexico coast. But who knows? Once it gets into that big bowl, the largest part of the Gulf, who knows? Now again, and I can't take credit for this, I'm going to have to have, I am going to have to give credit to Karen she said, why did the National Weather Service not switch the names up and make this one Ginger? Because then it could have been Fred, Fred and, and Ginger, Ginger dancing across the, the Gulf go. of Mexico. One right behind the other. Yeah. Um, that would have been cute. And then what's the third one going to be named? It's named already. It is a tropical storm. It's named Henri. Henri. H-E-N-R-I. Henri. Say it through your nose like a Frenchman. It will be a storm that wears no deodorant. Henri, however, is just expected to meander out there in the Atlantic until it peters out. There's no computed landfall anywhere for Henri. Speaking of petering out, and knowing that in our great state, sports news always leads, I think the person that we You're like... You're having a little too much fun with I this. am. <laughs> I think the person that we like to dislike right after Nick Saban in this date is Timmy Tebow. See, I don't dislike Timmy Tebow. Oh, I do. Sanctimonious, pi pious, you know, crybaby. When LSU beat him in his junior year, he came off the field in tears. You don't gotta lose like a man. So anyway. Well, that's true. But I've always looked at Timmy Tebow as, you know, uh, unfortunately, we live in an age where if you're a good God-fearing Christian athlete, you get sneered at for that rather than. Oh no, that's Timmy not Tebow why. would take a knee. He'd take a knee in the end zone, to, you know, to, to thank God. You know what? Deion Sanders used to do that and make the sign of the cross. Nobody, nobody made fun of Deion. You know why? Deion could deliver. Yeah. Well, Deion Timmy, won. I remember that particular year. We had a lot of superstar quarterbacks come out of the NCAA and then absolutely flashed in the pan in the NFL. Well, he tried to move to running back and was terrible. Then he tried a professional baseball career. The Mets gave him a shot. Three seasons, he didn't make the opening day starting roster. They brought him up a couple times. It was awful. Well, the coach who uh, brought him to Florida, Urban Meyer, Gave him another chance with the Jacksonville Jaguars as a receiver. Now, maybe, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Well, no, it, it was like last week. Yep. And a lot of the scouts said he would be better off as a receiver than a quarterback when he first started college. You know what? College. For a quarterback, you make a great wide receiver. Yes. 
the Jaguars waived him yesterday. Here's the story. His blocking ranged from awkward to awful in Jacksonville's preseason opener against Cleveland on Saturday night, which was his 34th birthday, which is the age at which most tight ends are retiring, retiring from the NFL. Yeah. He failed to get a catch, and he played no steps on special teams. And he's such a putz. He tweeted, thankful for the highs and even the lows, the opportunities and the setbacks. I've never wanted to make decisions out of fear of failure, and I'm grateful for the chance to have pursued a dream. It's like, wow. Hey, he's just trying to go out on an up note. He was the fifth. He was the fifth string tight end on the Jacksonville Jaguars. Meyer, Somebody's got to be a bench warmer. Urban Meyer, well, he was supposed to be a seat filler. That's what he is. He is a, he is a, I mean, if you could get Dominic the dancing, talking mule to wear pads and a helmet, it's there to fill seats. Not okay? a Tim Tebow fan. Well, he's just such a putz. And you know what? You can be a putz. Just be it somewhere else and be quiet about it. What's he going to do next? Paddle ball? No, I think this may be... He's the freaking Danica Patrick of football. Nobody is going to put him in a commentator booth anytime soon. So I Well, think they this... tried that, and he sucked at that. Yeah, I think this may be the last we hear of Tim But he Tebow. did get a minimum contract for 920000 because his two failed seasons before... Counted, so he had to have the minimum of almost a million dollar. However, no guaranteed money. He'd have to make the team on opening day for real to earn any money. So he got zero zip nada. Well, there you go. And it's like, will you please just go away? That's what the Australians call fair dinkum. We're up against the only one worse than him, by the way, was his equally sanctimonious and equally pious and equally full of caca father. At least we don't have to hear from him anymore. There you go. Time now to then, take a break. Let's do what Tim Tebow did and get cut on Exiles TV. <laughs> I owed the IRS $10,000. The IRS garnished my wages. They put a lien on my house. I'm self-employed and didn't report all my income. They claim I owe a lot more than I do. The IRS is the most powerful collection agency in the world. They do not give up until you pay. I couldn't sleep. We were being audited. I called Tax Solutions Now and a great big weight was lifted off my shoulders. I called Tax Solutions Now and they got the IRS off my back. Tax Solutions Now had my wage garnishment lifted in 48 hours. Tax Solutions Now can get you help. Our agents know the rules, can stop the pain, and get you the best deal. Tax Solutions Now saved my business. I qualified for the Fresh Start program. I paid less than I owed. We connect you with a team of former IRS agents and tax professionals who get the IRS off your back. Time is running out. Call Tax Solutions Now. Call 800-778-4345. 800-778-4345. Hi, I'm Bobby Yarborough with Manda Fine Meats. Here at Manda, we know what the folks of South Louisiana love. They love great flavored smoked sausage, delicious deli meats, and specialty items like boudin and andouille sausage. Manda Fine Meats has been providing these products since 1947. We produce them right here in Baton Rouge, so you know you're always getting the freshest product at your local grocery store. Manda Fine Meats. Taste the fresh local flavor in everything we make. Make it Manda every time. No one can stop me when I taste the feeling Nothing could ever bring me down Nothing, nothing could ever bring me down Taste the feeling
Welcome back to Exiles TV. Uh, State Representative John Stefanski will be with us in our next segment, uh, talking about what's going on at the State House and reapportionment. In other words, redistricting is coming up. We'll talk about that. But wow, have you seen? Have you watched? This absolute cluster in Afghanistan. Absolutely, I've been watching it. Uh, I actually was moved to something close to, you know, I don't cry easily, but I was really choked up, the clemped, as our friends say, uh, watching it happen because it re so much of the images that we saw reminded me of us bailing out of Vietnam mm -hmm. because we had to admit that we just couldn't keep up with this war anymore because we didn't fight the war the way they fought the war. Um, and then when I saw people trying to cling to the outside of a cargo plane leaving Kabul and you try and hang on to the outside of a car, you ain't Tom Cruise, you can't hang on to the outside of a cargo plane. You can't hang on the outside of any airplane once it gets to take off speed. And uh, I saw three different individuals falling from that plane uh, in still photos. Mm -hmm and that brought back memories of 9-11 when people would rather dive off the burning building than stay in it and die that way. Um, obviously it might not have been a smart decision, it may have been a com completely ignorant decision, but the decision was made, I'd rather die trying to hang on to this plane than stay here with these people. Well, I, I, I would think a lot of them were hopeful they could make their way into a wheel well and maybe survive that as other people have in the past, but the, the fact of the matter is why on earth would anybody from George W. Bush, who took us there, to Barack Obama, to Donald Trump, who negotiated withdrawal, to Joe Biden, who sped it up, why would any of them take the word of anybody in that godforsaken country that is known for nothing but fighting and lying their entire damn history? Yep. They have a name for it. I can't read. Is it called taqiyya? Mm -hmm. They have a name for it in the Islamic faith. Taqiyya. T-A-Q-Q-I-Y-A-H. And what the tenets of taqiyya basically say is, it's not lying if you say it to an infidel. You know, it's, it's okay to lie if you lie to an infidel what because I mean? he's an infidel. So they lie their asses off all the time. The American troops that are going back to make sure that the Americans in the embassy and the others who, who aided us, which again is old CIA doctrine, going back to Vietnam. Going let's, back to Charlie Wilson. Yeah, let's give, them, let's give them jobs. Let's make them understand that we're winning their hearts and minds. Well, but, some and some of them we did. There were American-friendly people that are being beat up and murdered over there yeah, now. Yeah, you, you can't leave them behind. Because they worked with us. Yeah, we, they got to go yeah. out when you go. We but left anyway, thousands behind. We, they are going to be facing American weapons, American ammunition, because the defense force, which five times that I can remember, by the way, over the last 15 to 20 years, turned their weapons on their American allies when it suited them. Mm -hmm. They call it green on blue. But that defense force, which we equipped to the tune of a trillion dollars with our best modern weapons, and we trained, they wet their pants, they threw their weapons down, and aye, they aye, said, aye, hey, aye, I'm aye. your friend now. Um, they did nothing. And the president, who said, I will be here. I will be here to lead you. Said, but first, I need to go to the bathroom. Is my plane ready? Yeah. Why would anybody, anybody who has intelligence, and I mean not just CIA-type intelligence, but something in the cranium, believe anything any one of these people would say when they live their entire existence as being a large sack of fecal matter. A couple of quick points. One, our president was, I don't want to say hiding out, but he was conspicuously missing. He was at Camp David, oh, yeah. where he's not generally available to the press. And why did we leave so much ordnance there? We left dozens and dozens of drones. We left armored personnel carriers with 50 caliber machine guns on them and ammunition. Because the Afghan defense forces were going to use them. A Afghanistan now owns, because we left so many there, they now own more Black Hawk helicopters than 106 other countries mm -hmm. because we left them all of ours. They were going to use them. 
They were going to defend themselves. They were going to fight for themselves. Why would you believe in Especially when we saw the same thing happen in Iraq. <coughs> we went into Iraq and we trained the Iraqi Defense Force to defend their country against the incursions of Al-Qaeda. And when it came right down to it, they dropped their rifles and said, I surrender. Listen, this goes back to the Korean War. If you are allied with somebody who looks exactly like the ones you're fighting, when things go bad, it's pretty easy for them to drop their weapons and change sides, because you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. It happened in Vietnam. The Army of the Republic of Vietnam was a freaking joke. Yep, we have a terrible track record with training freedom fighters. And the, the Taliban, instead of being contained and annihilated, were allowed to roam freely as long as they weren't firing a weapon. You don't think that they didn't go to some colonel in the Defense Force's house and say, we'll be back to kill all of you unless your husband backs off. I mean, they, they were working a better intelligence operation than we were. And it is disgusting, it is shameful, but the big question, Kevin, is have we learned our lesson? Are we sending to Bill Cassidy and Garrett Graves and, and John Kennedy, we want you to tell everybody in the CIA, the Defense Department, the White House, in Congress, both houses, no more of this crap. If the Middle East becomes critical because of oil, we built the oil fields anyway, we'll just go and take it. But other than that, let them kill each other. Mm -hmm. Well, why were we in Afghanistan ostensibly? Because we were after uh, Al-Qaeda over 9-11 and we wanted Osama bin Laden. Where did we find Osama bin Laden? Out in Afghanistan. No, no, not in Afghanistan. We found him hiding out in Pakistan, a country we thought we were fairly friendly with. The thing is, you can take all the stands and hold them in one hand and fill your other hand with you know what and guess which one fills up first. Well, yeah, and do you remember the heat that our former president took when he referred to that part of the world as asshole countries? Mm -hmm. And was he wrong about this? No, and, and, and you know, I, they, to me, <clears throat> they are not worth the price of a bullet, let alone one drop of American blood. The doctrine was, well, it keeps them from overrunning Europe and getting to the United States of America. When they've got a force big enough that it looks like they're threatening unit, just bring in the B-1Bs and the B-52s and take care of it. Mm -hmm. We should have never had a foot on the ground. We could have done every bit of this from the air. I've said that many. How many times when we were doing a radio show did I say less infantry, more air force? Well, the thing is they wanted to try to convert these people. The thing is, they're used to converting to whoever is closest to them with a weapon. Do you know what my missus used to tell me about that part of the country? Especially uh, when we were in Iraq, was airdrop Western culture. Airdrop in DVDs, Blu-ray players, Playboy magazine, Fredericks of Hollywood catalog. Bombard them with Western culture. Well, you saw what happened in Kabul. All the beauty salons and all that had to paint over all of their displays mm -hmm. of great hairstyles and great fashion. Yep, because it, now it's going to, you know, the burqa is going to be. These are, delivered. these are a good example. You know, when when the mob was operating at its peak in Chicago, New York, Miami, Cleveland, Detroit, New Orleans, Los Angeles, you'd go out and buy politicians. And the, the byword was, if you buy them, they stay bought. The trouble with these people in this part of the world is if you buy them, they don't stay bought. Yep. What I would have done is the first time we had a green on blue attack, I would have killed a thousand for each American that was killed. And I would have announced that I was going to do it and say, now. You want to rethink your position on this? But we don't do that. We like to play namby-pamby until it all goes to crap. Well, We're Jim Tebow, for God's sake. I think that the previous president has on the right track. We were energy self-sufficient. We didn't need to rely on that part of the world or the OPEC nations for energy. Well, we didn't get a damn thing out of Afghanistan anyway except pain. And heroin. We got gobs and gobs of heroin. Oh, wait a minute. I want that. Yeah. Kidding gobs of heroin. And if you don't think that there's interests 
people that are legitimate people that are interested in keeping that heroin flowing. Mm -hmm. Time to take another break. When we come back, we're going to shift to uh, state. We're going to talk about redistricting Louisiana, budget, your taxpayer dollars, and more. That's all on the way on Exiles TV. Live and play on the fairway at Greystone Golf and Country Club, a serene, challenging golf destination located in Denham Springs. For tee times and membership opportunities, go to greystonecountryclub.com. Hi, I'm Hurricane Betsy Barnes. And I'm Dr. Kay Silla with the Rocket Right Show. We are two busy blondes on the go showing off life in Louisiana. Watch us on Pelican Sports Network. And talk 107.3 FM. Check local listings for times. This is State Treasurer John Schroeder urging you to check your mailbox. We just mailed out four and a half million dollars of unclaimed property checks to people across Louisiana. Unclaimed property is lost money turned over to the Department of Treasury so we can return it to you. The process is so easy, you can claim it right from your phone. Check for yourself, check for your family, and don't forget to check your businesses. This is your money, claim it. Check your mailbox and cash your check, it's that easy. Hi, I am Dr. Farrell Frugier, Jr., and I am a general dentist at Frugier Family Dentistry. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to Catholic High School, LSU, and LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, where I received my DDS degree in 1986. I always have and will continue to be committed to continuing my education, to invest in technology, which makes the diagnosis and delivery of dentistry more thorough, more comfortable, and more aesthetically pleasing. In our practice, we are here to serve the patients. We want to improve their quality of life and to develop relationships with our patients. In dentistry, we have a chance to impact lives on a daily basis, not just by doing dentistry, but by getting to know them and being a part of their life. We also believe in giving back to our community. So every year, we give back to the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center. Please stop by and visit our office. We would love to take care of you and your family. Go where summer leads you in an award-winning Mazda CUV. Find yours during Mazda's season of discovery. Call, click, or come by and discover your new Mazda today at Baton Rouge's Mazda dealer. Team Mazda on airline. Hey. We're back with Exiles TV. Sorry, we went live because you caught us in mid-conversation with our guest. And by the way, thanks for the uh, refreshing, cool aqua pura here. Mine, mine's got vodka in it. <laughs> Just so you know. I was so dry, man. I, oof, terrible. Felt like I'm trudging across the Sierra here. Our, our guest uh, this afternoon is uh, State Sahara. Representative John Stefanski. Uh, he serves on a number of committees uh, in the House, uh, but he is an expert or is about rapidly to become an expert on a couple yeah. different things. And number one is you're not on the Appropriations Committee, but you're on the Budget Control Committee. And as you were telling me before we went on the air, one of the things is all of this stimulus money that's going to come in that could be used, excuse me, for infrastructure, how is that sitting right now? Yeah, so certainly I think there's a lot of unknown. You know, the feds are talking about a, a trillion dollar infrastructure package. And so obviously one of the, if you listen to one of our senators, uh, Dr. Cassidy, he's talked about how much money could be coming in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, naturally as somebody who, you know, really a lot of us, we have so much infrastructure problems in Louisiana. I mean, that's, I mean, our roads are horrible. Oh, yes. That's no secret. And they've been for a long time. So if this is going to happen, and money's going to be spent here in Louisiana on infrastructure, obviously there's going to be a list of projects that everybody wants to talk about and what could, could happen. So really, there's a tremendous amount of talk about that. If this thing passes, what projects are the ones that are actually going to get funded? And, so, uh, and the question is, uh, you know, we've got a $14 billion backlog of projects. I heard Dr. Cassidy say it's somewhere between one and a half and $2 billion. That won't go very far. No, absolutely. Well, th yeah, think about it. That won't even cover 25% of the problems that we have. And then the second issue is going to be, is there going to be a local match on that? So Louisiana, you know, when we draw down federal, federal dollars every year, we always have to put up a percentage of that money. Mm -hmm. And so what's that going to be on those 2 to $4 billion that Louisiana might well, and, get? Well, and, you know, and the real big problem is 
we don't have any Charlie Wilsons left. <laughs> we don't have, I represent a district that doesn't need or want anything. Mm -hmm. So every representative, every senator is not going to go home to his or her constituents and say, well, really, East Baton Rouge Parish needed the money more than we did. So I didn't put anything into the appropriations request. Now, if I may, following Bill's train of thought, your district is the Crowley area. It is. What does your district need? It needs roads like everybody else. You know, we have a tremendous amount of state highways in, in my district, mm -hmm. and they're in very, very bad shape. So, but I mean, look, look, one thing that you can find commonality with, though, is, is we talk about these mega projects. Mm -hmm. So even though my district in particular doesn't have, you know, maybe isn't Lafayette, I have a couple precincts in Lafayette, but isn't the heart of Lafayette, I can appreciate what it's going to do for, for commerce if we finish I-49. Okay. Same can be said for the Baton Rouge Bridge. That's not my district. It doesn't immediately affect me. But if we find a way to move people in and out of this state in a more efficient manner, well, then all of a sudden you, your communities can take jobs in Baton Rouge because you can actually commute there mm -hmm. in an efficient way. And so I can recognize that. And, and I can, a person in my position could sell something like that back home with that thought. Now, here's where the problem comes. You're exactly right. If we're talking about Baton Rouge, is anything other in Baton Rouge, you know, maybe than these mega projects, that's a very hard thing for me to sell. Like the new bridge across the Mississippi River. Yeah, well, but I mean, I consider that something big, but I mean, yeah, anything else other than that, I have a hard time going back home to my constituents and saying, oh, that's a win for us. Well, not really. We have bad highways. Why are you paving their highways? Right. So exactly. Those, those are issues. And so how, where that money is going to go, what that local match is going to be, and, and who gets to pick. Here's another thing. All right, so we're all term limited in the House and in the Senate. Okay, I'm only here for at a maximum 12 years. Right. So when do these projects start and what priority order, you oh. know, is a big issue as well because promising your constituents that your project's going to start in 20 years is a hard sell yep. too. Well, and, and, you know, I don't think a lot of people understand the priority system. You know, the feds will announce that you're going to get a, a great big grant and it's priority three. Exactly. Which means it's not even going to get looked at for a potential starting point for, for what, five years, six years? Yeah, and look, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Since I've been in the legislature, I've had multiple things funded that I have not seen groundbreaking yet. And, and it's incredibly frustrating as a legislator because you go home and you go, okay, I've, I've got the money. I think, <laughs> you know, and but you can't give an exact date when it's going to start because it gets caught up in that administrative procedure. Well, and by administrative, you're talking about environmental impact studies, engineering firms having to sign off Surveys, on having to Surveys. buy right of ways. Mm -hmm. If it affects a, a navigable waterway, you have to get Army Corps of Engineers support. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of... You may have to negotiate right. with landowners for your right of way, blah, blah, blah. hundred percent. So... That can be very frustrating. What, what time those projects start, where they're located, are all things that we as legislators right now are very curious about. And look, the bill still hasn't passed yet. Everyone, the assumption is that that bill is going to pass, but it still hasn't passed yet. You have a lot of detractors. You know, you have a lot of congressmen and senators who are openly speaking out about it. One of them's ours. You know, I, I hear Senator Kennedy talking talking about it uh, multiple times, and then I hear the opposite from Senator Cassidy. So, let let's see what happens. Is, well, is Senator the, uh, Kennedy seems to think there's too much trash that's not related to. To infra actual infrastructure, and I heard actually the uh, majority leader, uh, Mr. Schumer, saying uh, using the phrase "human infrastructure." It's like what? <laughs> yeah, you know, because when you and I think of infrastructure, I'm thinking of concrete, I'm thinking of roads, roads, I'm thinking bridges, of steel, internet, yeah. electricity. Asphalt. Now you can you can sell me. Look, you can sell me on broadband, I, and I understand that it, the internet is such a core thing now, especially if you want to be able to work from home. We do need that, and you can sell me on that. But when it's you an start, essential utility. It is when you start deviating beyond that into some of the, like you said your human elements. It, it, it's really hard for me to sell. That to, to Louisianians. Well, what we've got is at the federal level, and, and it unfortunately is forced down to the state level, is we have to have a lot of game playing. They labeled this an infrastructure bill, but it's really another omnibus spending bill. But they knew they'd get a lot more buy-in if they said it was an infrastructure bill. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, playing games. Give it a nice name everybody likes. Yeah. No, and look, and I've, I've heard, you know, also from some of our delegation members that, you know, we didn't get enough for this. We gave away Republican votes mm -hmm. without necessarily getting enough concessions, you know, so that the whole political angle kind of like you're talking about as well. And, and, and I think that's all relevant. There's still federal money promised to Louisiana that we're still waiting for, too, for other things. Uh, there's still flood relief money coming. 
uh, southwest Louisiana, not far from your district, hasn't gotten anything for two hurricanes mm -hmm. that hit them wham wham just like that. Uh, yeah, go look, go ask, go ask Lake Charles about funding. You mm -hmm. know, what I mean, Lake Charles feels like they have significantly been shortchanged well, you, based you, on the devastation that they had. You'd have to ask Ronnie Johns uh, on a stool at LaBerge right now if you want to talk to him. <laughs> well, y you know, but yes, we, we look. The thing about the the what's no secret about Louisiana is we have a ton and ton of needs, infrastructure needs. And look, this this federal benefit bill could really benefit Louisiana. You know, uh, I'm looking at it from the state legislator's perspective, not necessarily necessarily from the federal perspective. Here is the question that your average taxpayer asks. When the budget is north of $30 billion, and we and, and most of us know that a lot of it's federal pass-through, so mm -hmm. the actual the actual within state budget is what, somewhere around nine to ten billion? Mm -hmm. Still, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Where does it all go? I could explain it to you, but it'd take a, a couple spreadsheets. We'd have to put it but up that's on what, here. That's what taxpayers want to know. Where the hell does $10 billion go? Let me tell you from my perspective what I've seen. I've been in the legislature for five years. Um, everything of substance is locked up in the Constitution. Everything, mm -hmm. okay? So when we talk about flexibility, I got that conversation all the time with people. Why don't you just cut everything 5 to 10% across the board? Let's, let's downsize this. Let's free up some money for maybe infrastructure and some of these things we talk about. You can. It takes a vote of the people to free up almost everything except for health care and higher education. And so all of your cuts end up coming from that when the times are bad. And when the times are good, you just can't adjust anything and, and, and allocate funding. So the statutorily dedicated funds are not of significant size? No, they are. They are a significant size, but we can change those. You know, mm -hmm. House Bill 1, every time we pass the uh, appropriations bill every year, that is the most recent expression of the legislature. So that becomes the law and supersedes any other statutory law. But anything locked up in the Constitution, any of these dedicated funds that say this must be funded at this level that's in the Constitution, we can't touch without a vote of the people. And, and we've or a seen constitutional it, convention. Or a constitutional convention, which I've supported multiple times. I've spoken on it multiple times. I think ultimately Louisiana will decide. I think it's going to take a while and, and other efforts that fail, but ultimately we're going to end up to a position where we, we have to go unlock that Constitution and, and free up some Well, things. the Machiavellian brilliance of the people in legislatures past who have managed to get dedicated funds of their liking locked up in the Constitution is absolutely brilliant. I don't know of, of most electorates that would sit still for that. So now what you've got, as you, as you so appropriately pointed out, is the vast majority of our tax money is locked up by the hand of people who were in the legislature 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago with all these amendments. Some of them have shuffled off the mortal coil. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I think, you know, what's frustrating is, look, when times are good, it's easy to say we need to fund all these things. It's when times are bad. And, and as a legislator, it's so frustrating. When times are bad in Louisiana, we don't get the tax revenue that we normally have, or we have a disaster or something like that. You want flexibility. You want to be able to look and say, hey, I understand this area is very important that we fund, but can we just cut it? 5%? Can we cut this one 5% so that we don't have to raise taxes again? Mm -hmm. So that we don't have to look at, at, at new other raising or new types of taxes again? It seems like it always falls on that you have to raise taxes in order to be able to do anything when mm -hmm. times get tough, but which, it, is, which is incredibly frustrating. Yeah, in a great many ways, though, a state legislature, it can be ours or it can be Texas or it can be Mississippi, uh, is a lot like the United Way. You know, when Red Cross goes to the United Way, I forget where their headquarters is, but I believe it's in New York, and says, we would like $24 million, they say, show me your need. Everybody has to request and prove why they need it. Mm -hmm. And then the legislature, in this case, the United Way says, you're not going to get 24. You're going to get 21. Mm -hmm. You, you proved you need your 15. You're going to get your 15. And I have no idea why our legislature and so many other legislatures will not 
even look at look at it that way. Well, we do, and let's go back to what, what I was just talking they about. Do. Yeah. They will. We'll have different agencies. We'll have transportation. We'll have a higher ed. We'll have all these agencies come in. But again, let's go back to what I talked about. So many of their funding sources are either self-generated, to where we can't touch them, mm -hmm. or or they're locked in the Constitution. You might say, well, we, we think you have too much money already. Okay, but we actually control our budget. And, and those it's just so difficult to change the funding structure. Goes back to constitutional conventions. Goes back to maybe a governor coming in and really saying we're going to change things. The only reason we had the last constitutional convention is because Edwin Edwards ran on that. It was his campaign promise. He got in and boom, he did it. Mm -hmm. And I really think if another governor took that by the horns and tried to come in and do that, he, he would have some success. We are talking with John Stefanski. He's a member of the state legislature, uh, state house of representatives in District 42. That is Crowley in the surrounding area. And we'll be back with more. We're going to talk about reapportionment, redistricting. That's going to be a mess. And it's coming up next on Exiles TV. <laughs> Bellello's Furniture and Appliances, your dependable independent. Depend on us for service, for selection, for price. Get huge Whirlpool savings. Shop now and save on Whirlpool appliances throughout the store. Plus, experience our price match guarantee and ask about special financing. You can depend on the know-how of people who live appliances every day. Bellello's Furniture and Appliances, your dependable independent with nationwide buying power. Hello guys, it's Debbie. It's time. I've got a brand new location. 10510 Airline Highway, Baton Rouge, next to After Five Tuxedos. We have the perfect spot to get all your wedding and formal wear needs. Come see our one-of-a-kind name brand and get great prices. With 30 years experience, the best customer service anywhere. It's Debbie's Bridal, Airline Highway, Baton Rouge. See you soon. Hi, I'm Hurricane Betsy Barnes. And I'm Dr. Kay Siller with The Rocket Right Show. We are two busy blondes on the go showing off life in Louisiana. Watch us on Pelican Sports Network. And Talk 107.3 FM. Check local listings for times. This is State Treasurer John Schroeder urging you to check your mailbox. We just mailed out four and a half million dollars of unclaimed property checks to people across Louisiana. Unclaimed property is lost money turned over to the Department of Treasury so we can return it to you. The process is so easy, you can claim it right from your phone. Check for yourself, check for your family, and don't forget to check your businesses. This is your money. Claim it. Check your mailbox. And cash your check. It's that easy. Sometimes life is wonderful. And sometimes it's not. Cherish the good but always be prepared for life's challenges. At Private Healthcare, we provide the peace of mind you deserve. With Private Healthcare, you'll get the coverage you want and healthcare you need. If your employer doesn't supply healthcare coverage and you don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid, you need to give us a call right now. Private Healthcare is private health insurance for ages 65 and under with medical, dental, vision, and even prescription coverage. When life comes at you unexpectedly, you need to be ready. And health insurance is your financial safety net. Health insurance has never been so easy and affordable. If you're looking for health coverage at the best price and your annual household income is $35,000 or more, call the number on the screen now and speak with a live health care consultant. Don't wait. Get the coverage you need now. Exiles TV, glad to have you along with us. State Representative John Stefanski is uh, our guest today, and we're going to sh uh, shift from money to uh, redistricting. Nobody likes to do this. <laughs> what, what are you foreseeing as, as what's going to start to happen with redistricting? Yeah, so I'm the chair of House and Governmental Affairs, and so I'm, I chair one of the committees that all this stuff starts in. The bills either have to start in Senate Governmental Affairs or they have to start in House and Governmental Affairs. And so uh, we just got the numbers. We got the numbers last Thursday, the official census numbers. I have staff who are actually working with those numbers right now to verify them, to make sure they match up with our districts and match up with the numbers correctly. And uh, it's, 
Look, it's, it's personal. That's what redistricting is, and that's what I found out. I have met with all 104 House members. I've actually met with a couple extra because we had some members who left in, in between. Uh, I've met with a number of the congressmen, a number of the PSC members, a number of the Bessie members. Oh, all those are subject to. I forgot They about are. That. A number yeah. of the judiciary. I have met with a lot of people. Draw it all up. And what, has, what I have learned in that process is that this is very personal, and everyone has an opinion on their district. No one says... Yeah, no, however you feel like drawing that yeah. district. Whatever and so, yeah, and so look, I, I think it's going to be tough. It is. And, and, and we've seen shifting in Louisiana. We've seen population loss in North Louisiana. We've seen gains along the I-10-12 corridor. And anytime you have shifts like that, you're going to have to make some significant changes to the geography of those districts. And so I, I think therein lies the problem. A personal perspective on districts combined with changes uh, makes for some interesting times. In 2011 it was literally impossible to have, you were still under a consent decree, to have a majority minority congressional district. Mm -hmm. It was literally impossible to not gerrymander and have one and meet that degree. So District 2, as you've seen, it, it's, it's all over the place. It used to be shaped like a Z. It starts, <laughs> well that was, I think uh, Representative Fields proposed yes. the, the Z-shaped district. It was ultimately rejected, but still, it, it, that's going to be another big job is coming up with, because the, you know, the black populations tend to migrate a bit within state. Yeah, well, and, and there's I'll a growing you, black population in northwest Louisiana. What do you do about that? There is, and, and look, I think you go back to the core principles of redistricting. You go to the law, mm -hmm. the numbers, and fairness. And you look at those three. And fairness is a broad term. It means something different to everybody. But, I mean, you follow, you follow the law about what it says you have to do on how you have to protect communities of interest and voting patterns. And then you follow uh, the Constitution, you know. And, and, and then you follow the numbers. The districts all have to be a, the same size or a slight deviation. Congress is really the only one that has to be on the, on the number. And, and you follow where the population is going and try to be as fair as possible with that process. It's, it's just extremely difficult. I'll tell you about Congressional District 2 from what we're seeing since we do have the numbers. It stayed pretty much the same as, long, as far as population goes. So uh, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of shift. Uh, you know, there were some wild expectations that the Orleans area may grow, you know, by 100,000 people, everyone after Katrina possibly moving back. What I am seeing, and we're still working through those numbers, is, is it's not that. I haven't seen that tremendous amount of shift. The, the only major cities, I think, that showed growth that kind of surprised everybody were East Baton Rouge, Parish, and Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. Yeah, and Lafayette has some growth, and then you're seeing a lot of growth in the uh, North Shore area. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of growth in that North Shore area. Lafayette, south of Lafayette, you've seen a lot of people move into that U Broussard Youngsville area. Uh, you've seen some growth in Orleans. It just hasn't been as significant, I think, as people were, were expecting. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I mean, look, the process is we, we basically are coming up with a calendar right now to do a what we like to call a road show. We're going to tour all across the state. We're going to go to every major municipality. And the purpose of that is to get the opinion of people. We're going to show them, hey, here's what your district was 10 years ago. Here's what it looks like now. How do you think it should change to accomplish our goal? In your mind, what's going to be the more difficult task, the federal districts? or the state House and Senate districts? Federal districts, yeah. But we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of loss out of those two North Louisiana districts and where they go you know, to pick up those populations I think is going to be tough because you're talking about areas like Monroe and Shreveport creeping, going all the way down into traditional Acadiana areas, Baton Rouge areas, mm -hmm. North Shore areas. You, finding commonality between these two areas is very difficult sometimes, oh, sure. and, the, and that's a traditional redistricting principle, yeah, the, you know. Uh, and, and the district uh, Julia Letlow is in now, is that four? Is that it's four, four. yes. Four? Yeah. All right, that makes it all the way to about 35 miles as the crow flies from where we are sitting now. Yeah, part of four is in extreme northeast Baton Rouge Parish. Yeah, but it also goes north all the way to the Mississippi uh, it, border. It does. And, and I guess the Arkansas border as well. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, it follows the river and then comes across on the Florida parishes yeah. all the way over. So, I mean, how far south to get the population requirement is that going to have to go? Is it going to have to go all the way to I-10 or I-12 or even below that? Yeah, and I, and I just think that's it's very difficult. Think about it from even, you know, look, the congressmen don't get to draw their districts. That that power is vested in the legislature through the Constitution. However, you're a sitting congressman, you have a definite interest on in what your district looks sure. like. And so 
we, as a, as a state legislator, we have good relationships with all our congressmen. You know, I, I, my congressman is Congressman Higgins. I have a good one with him. I have all the congressmen I, I speak to and are friendly with. And when they're coming in and putting, possibly giving their input on, on different legislators, that's tough. Well, and, and it's the fact, I go, why I say it's going to be so difficult is because of the amount of loss that we've seen out of North Louisiana. It sounds from what you were saying, like District 1 will probably lose a bit to 2. District 6 might actually lose a bit to 2. Uh, We've seen growth. So what we're seeing out of the numbers is Congressman Scalise's district has grown. Mm -hmm. Congressman Graves has actually grown the most, we believe. Um, Congressman Carter's has pretty much stayed the same. Congressman Higgins has grown. But we've seen loss out of, again, the two North Louisiana ones. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of start to, you know, if you keep the same structure as we currently have, you can kind of start to guess about how things are going to just naturally have to shift to follow the population. Well, and, and the number is an, an odd number. What is it, like? Two hundred eighty-nine thousand per district. So a congressional like that. district a congressional is actually two six hundred and six hundred and eighty thousand. Six hundred eighty thousand. Yeah. Excuse me. I believe the new ideals around there. It's a give or take a few thousand. So Garrett will probably have to since he's not going to be able to go east because that's where Julia's going to come in and that's where Troy's going to come in. He's going to have to go west. He may, well, but he's, if he's, already but he's over, but if he's over the ideal a little bit, then he might actually just be talking about giving up something or shifting, you know, mm -hmm. shifting to be able to accommodate maybe another one and then having to shift into another area. Because redistricting, it's a big puzzle. You know, we have these, we have, so let's take Congress, for example. We have six pieces. We've got to fit them somehow. And they all have to be equal in population. So every time you've got to shift one to move it, the other one has to shift. And, and, and so... That becomes very difficult as well. You know, uh, what's somebody willing to give up? What are the members in that area looking to give up? And then look, we can't take the politics out of it. For every congressman and, and uh, ha who has an interest, there's a, a House member or a Senate member who says, well, maybe one day that might be my congressional yeah. seat I'm running from. So they have a tremendous interest in what those look like as well. Now, who actually draws these proposed districts to bring before your committees? Is so, I mean, have demographers or? Yeah, I mean, we have demographer help, but I mean, technology has advanced to a, a, a state to where, I mean, obviously, I won't, I'll, I'm not going to say I could probably do that myself, but I can. You know, if you have, a, if you have a good knowledge of what the district can be, and you can sit down with the technology we have now and draw districts. The public's going to be able to draw districts and submit them you know there's a process for that as well and so uh, I think if we were having this conversation maybe 30 years ago I mean outside of a prof professional demographer you probably it's be impossible with the technology with computers now uh, you know I could sit down and, and, and draw them but certainly look I have a full staff that helps me do that we have a full staff on the House governmental affairs side Senate governmental affairs side we have the clerk of the house who's a very intelligent attorney who's gonna be helping there's a number of people around the Capitol who are gonna help draw these things just for the sake of conversation if we didn't have the protection of populations of interest and it was simply the numbers what would the map look like Oh, I, I, look, I, I think that's a difficult question because what did I talk about from the beginning? I said it's three things. It's the law, it's the numbers, and it's fairness. And so, I mean, you're essentially talking about removing a huge leg of that stool, which I think it's just almost impossible to talk about redistricting. You, you would be guessing at that point. But I think if we're guessing, I think the political power would just take over. I mean, look at just a normal vote when we're debating any other bill. You know, what may, makes a bill look a certain way? Well, it's the political influence in that body. And I think even with those three core principles that guide our redistricting process, you can't take the politics out of redistricting. You can't, you know? People were elected as Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals and moderates and all that. All that molds in Louisiana legislature to create law, and, and I don't think this is going to be any different than that. However, we have tremendous amounts of litigation involved in, lit in these maps as well. I think all of the maps ultimately will probably be challenged on some level. Um, therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's different, but it's not. Is so it, that's, it, that's a, it's an impossible question for me to answer I, I, to you. I, I, I really feeling, think it is. Yeah. I have a feeling, uh, but uh, is the Justice Department still looking over our shoulder in Louisiana? So we don't have what's called pre-clearance anymore. Therefore, we don't have to get pre-approval anymore. However, the the principles that set up preclearance are still there. So your your laws and your case law have not changed, other than some tweaks on the edges. So we're still subject to the same scrutiny. The difference is you don't have to you don't have to have that stamp to say, okay, now we'll let you go forward. In the last couple of years in the regular sessions and some of the specials, things have gotten contentious. So you're got experience with that. But as I told you during the break, one of the most contentious things I ever witnessed 
was the last redistricting session. You you prepared for things to get hot, for things to get a little nasty? Yeah, I feel like since the day I got in the legislature, it's been contentious. I mean, when I came in, we were staring down the $2 billion deficit. You know, when I first came in, I, I, I feel like we, my entire tenure in the legislature has been like that. But this, this is different. I recognize that. It's very personal to each member. And, and ultimately, like everything, there's people who are happy and people who are unhappy. Yeah, I hope I am. You know, look, I, I, I try to do the best job I can, like every bill. You know, I, I ran for this office because I, I wanted to serve my community, wanted to serve the state. And, and I'm trying to do the best job I can with the tools that God gave me. They, and, and I think at the end of the day, that's all I can do. I have a great relationship with almost every member in that body. I consider almost all, uh, I consider all of them friends. You know, maybe they don't consider me a friend, but I consider them all friends. Well, that's a day to day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the it day. It all depends on what you did last week. You're exactly right. <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to be fair. I'm going to follow the numbers. And I'm going to try to do the best job I can. State Representative John Stefanski, again, watch the replay at 10 o'clock tonight. We'll be back to wrap, wrap it up after this break on Exiles TV. Yeah. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. That was wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. You should be able to. Caught spiders. Premier Pest Services. Hi, I am Dr. Farrell Frugier, Jr., and I am a general dentist at Frugier Family Dentistry. I was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I went to Catholic High School, LSU, and LSU School of Dentistry in New Orleans, where I received my DDS degree in 1986. I always have and will continue to be committed to continuing my education, to invest in technology, which makes the diagnosis and delivery of dentistry more thorough, more comfortable, and more aesthetically pleasing. In our practice, we are here to serve the patients. We want to improve their quality of life and to develop relationships with our patients. In dentistry, we have a chance to impact lives on a daily basis, not just by doing dentistry, but by getting to know them and being a part of their life. We also believe in giving back to our community. So every year, we give back to the Greater Baton Rouge Food Bank, Toys for Tots, and Mary Bird Perkins Cancer Center. Please stop by and visit our office. We would love to take care of you and your family. The all-new 22 Civic, now on sale at Team Honda on Segan Lane. Live and play on the fairway at Greystone Golf and Country Club, a serene, challenging golf destination located in Denham Springs. For tee times and membership opportunities, go to greystonecountryclub.com. Hi, business owners. Phase three. Woohoo! But do your customers know you're back? Well, that's where the Clarence Bug Show and Pelican Broadcasting can help. Right now, we've got great rates on advertising packages to help you get the word out. Shoot me an email at bugsclarence at gmail.com. Or better yet, call me up. I'd love to talk with you. 225-485-6839. Let's get together and make phase three the best it can possibly be. Got termites? Get Premier Pest. PremierPestServices.com Back to Exiles TV. You know, Ed, it's hard to do one of these episodes without the crime beat. Uh, for those of you in the Baton Rouge area, and this probably made it elsewhere, uh, in quiet Port Allen, there was an actual shootout in a supermarket parking lot uh, on uh, Sunday. According to Bo Port Allen police, that around 4.30 in Hubbin Supermarket, which is locally owned, been there for 50 years. Three women, two victims and a suspect, got into an argument inside the grocery store. They told them, hey, take, take that outside. outside. <laughs> and, so they did. And they did. According to the cops, 
One of the suspects, who is under arrest, pulled out a gun, and the victim also pulled out a gun and shot several times in self-defense. Two people were hit by the gunfire. Yolanda Gaines was arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated assault with a firearm. Kimberly Williams was also arrested and charged with one count of obstruction. There is one suspect who managed to make it out of there and has not been arrested. Hmm. This is in Port Allen, Louisiana, what? in Hubbins Supermarket. Now, what on earth do you yeah. suppose they got into an argument over in the supermarket that led to gunplay in the parking lot? But, I mean, you've also got these women. They appear to be... They Maybe look like in, somebody's grandma, both of them. Well, I don't even know if somebody's they appear, mom, somebody's grandma. They appear to be in their forties, maybe. You know, and why are they both packing on Sunday, going to the supermarket? Well, I think you're going to see a whole lot more people packing just because they don't feel safe in our area anymore. But that's supposed to be for your own defense, not for. You settling know, an argument. Settle, yeah, settle in somebody's hash in the parking lot. Now, um, there were witnesses, but <laughs> nobody has been able to talk to the witnesses to say what they overheard. Or overheard. What, what, what started this? What, did somebody grab, you know, the last sugar-free Dr. Pepper six-pack? Did somebody say, no? That's not your boneless, fully cut up chicken. That's mine. What I want to know I mean, <laughs> is, did it start because somebody was or was not wearing a mask? No. Well, I think we would have known about that. I've seen some. I've, I've seen well arguments, not yeah. not fights, and certainly not gunfights. But I have seen some wicked arguments over wearing or not wearing a mask. Well, and again, this is a three-way argument. Not most arguments don't start as three-way, which means somebody got into it on one side or the other of the argument. But Chamber of Commerce crime, absolute. If I was thinking of relocating to Port Allen, I'd say, yeah, I want to send my business there. Or as the song by Foo Fighters says, done, done, on to the next one. There you go. And we are on to the next edition of Exiles TV coming up Thursday, 12 noon, and we hope that you'll be with us. Don't forget this show repeats tomorrow, tonight at 10 o'clock, and we'll see you on Facebook tomorrow morning at 8. Have a good day, stay cool.